doubling of student loan interest rates. Lawmakers may also take up a bill reauthorizing the U.S. Export-Import Bank. And now live to the Senate floor here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, the protector of nations, hallowed be your name. Give this day to the members of this legislative body such self-discipline that they will choose not what they wish, but what they ought. Give them also the strength of will, so that they may accept the right, however difficult it is, and refuse the wrong, however attractive it may be. Lord, give them the wisdom to pray for each other, not only for those with whom they agree, but also for those whom they might disagree. Impart to them a unity of spirit as they deal with the diversity of ideas. We pray in your gracious name. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., May 10, 2012, to the Senate. Under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Tom Udall, a senator from the state of New Mexico, to perform the duties of the chair. Signed, Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. Majority Leader is recognized. I move now to proceed to count number 396, H.R. 2072. The clerk will report. Motion to proceed to calendar number 396, H.R. 2072, an act to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank of the United States and for other purposes. Mr. President, we're now on the motion to proceed to the XM bill. I hope we can pass the bill today. I haven't had an opportunity today to speak to the Republican leader, but I'll do that shortly and we'll decide if there's a way forward on that. So I ask consent that the next hour be equally divided and controlled between two leaders or the designees, with the majority controlling the first half and the Republicans controlling the second half. Without objection. Note the absence of quorum. Mr. Akaka. President. The majority leader is recognized. I ask consent to call corn be terminated. Without objection. Mr. President, on a strong bipartisan vote yesterday, the House passed a piece of common sense job creating legislation, the reauthorization of the Export Import Bank, that we refer to, refer to as the XM Bank legislation. For many, many years, this legislation has helped American companies grow and sell their products overseas, creating tens of thousands of jobs. And for years, the bank has enjoyed broad bipartisan support. Passed by unanimous consent, 
uh, on one occasion and by voice vote on another occasion. This is a perfect example of the kind of smart investments Congress should be making to spur job growth. So I hope the Senate will be able to quickly approve the House pass measure today and do it by unanimous consent. I'm optimistic that the 330 to 93 vote in the House yesterday will be enough to convince Senate Republicans they shouldn't hold up this legislation any longer. 330 to 93. The process of reauthorizing the Export Impact Bank has taken too long. I hope we don't have to file cloture on this matter, but I will if we must. Let me remind you, Mr. President, the Senate considered reauthorizing this important legislation in March, two months ago. Senate Republicans had an opportunity to support the measure then. Instead, all but three opposed it, and the measure failed. American exporters have already waited in limbo for two months to see whether Republicans would come around to backing this business-friendly, job-creating issue. Businesses shouldn't have to wait longer. We can't afford more of the partisan obstruction we saw on this common sense legislation last March. To get to the President's desk, this Congress and every piece of every piece of legislation that we pass must get to his desk or it doesn't become law. So to do that, we need Democratic votes and Republican votes. That's just a reality. And it means we absolutely must work together if we want to get anything done. One man who has always been willing to extend a hand to colleagues across the aisle is the senior senator from Indiana, Senator Richard Luger. His first priority has always been getting things done for the American people. Whether that means keeping the world safe from nuclear war or looking out for Hoosiers back home. One of the most uh, historic pieces of legislation is known as Nun Luger. It's an effort to reduce the number of nuclear weapons in our country and in the Soviet Union. Very important piece of legislation, bipartisan. Luger of Georgia, and I'm not sure, Luger of Indiana, and none of Georgia. Important legislation. He's been an advocate for the people of Indiana as well as dedicated student of international affairs. He's never missed a meeting. I have the opportunity to call meetings with foreign dignitaries, and he's always there, seated at the table. Senator Luger has always put the American people, in my estimation, first, and his political party second. I was elected to Senate to serve each and every Nevadan, not only Democrats, though I'm proud to be one. Senator Luger was elected to serve every Hoosier, regardless of political affiliation, and he's done so well and wisely in the Senate for more than three decades. Throughout the history of this country, even in the most trying times, that's times of great social and political unrest, our elected representatives have worked together despite their differences to do what's right for all Americans. So I worry when I see dedicated patriots like Senator Luger drummed out by Tea Party zealots for being too willing to cooperate. But that's what happened on Tuesday. I worry when I hear a candidate, uh, hear a candidate for the U.S. Senate campaigning against bipartisanship and compromise between their two parties. That's really what he did. So there's too much compromise in the Congress. But that's what happened on Tuesday. And I worry when a candidate for the U.S. Senate says clearly that he'll put political party and partisanship before country and compromise. But that's what happened on Tuesday. That's nothing to be proud of, Mr. President. That kind of attitude is why longtime political observers like Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein describe today's GOP as ideologically extreme and scornful of compromise. And it's why my friend Senator Luger said this morning in his concession speech, uh, I'm, I'm not this morning, I'm sorry, Mr. President, that's why my friend Senator Luger said yesterday in his concession speech, bipartisanship is not the opposite of principle. One can be very conservative or very liberal and still have a bipartisan mindset. Such a mindset acknowledges that the other party is also patriotic and may have some good ideas. That's a direct quote from Senator Luger. Bipartisanship is not the opposite of principle. One can be very conservative, very liberal, and still have a bipartisan mindset. Such a mindset acknowledges that the other party is also patriotic and may have some good ideas. We should all remember, regardless of our party, that it's been the hallmark of this country for more than 200 years, and especially the United States Senate. Compromise.
Mr. President. Republican leader. I certainly share my friend the Majority Leader's views about Senator Luger's record, but I would remind my colleagues he has eight more months uh, to be among us and to serve this uh, country, and I think an appropriate time uh, to celebrate his outstanding career would be when it comes uh, to an end here in the Senate. With regard to what's been going on here in the Senate, uh, the problem clearly is the majority, which seems not to be interested in accomplishing anything, but rather turning the Senate floor into an opportunity for show votes uh, for the President and his campaign. Earlier this week, the President repackaged a list of old ideas into a post-it note checklist uh, for Congress. He said he did not want to overload Congress. Unfortunately, besides the weekly political show votes, to which I just referred, to coincide with the President's campaign schedule, the work that needs to be done uh, isn't. No budget, nothing to prevent the largest tax hike in history, and House passed bills sitting in the hopper. And while the President is uh, trying to manufacture arguments that he can run on, House Republicans have spent the last year and a half voting on and passing energy and jobs bills. In fact, more than two dozen job proposals are currently collecting dust on the majority leader's desk. One after another, the House has passed a budget, small business tax bill, bills to expand domestic energy production, and bills to reduce burdensome job-killing regulations. And despite some saying nothing can get done in election year, they're not done yet over in the House. I commend my House colleagues for their leadership, energy, and good work. So I have a suggestion. Instead of focusing on his political post-it note checklist, the President and Senate Democrats should show some leadership and work with Republicans to move on critical pro-growth bills. These proposals will help provide certainty and provide a much-needed boost to our economy. It would allow businesses to plan for the future and to begin to hire again. Common ground can be achieved on these jobs bills, and Republicans stand ready to work with Democrats to get them passed. With nearly 13 million Americans unemployed and millions more underemployed or giving up looking for work altogether, inaction and political gimmicks and games are really just not acceptable. Action is required by this President and this Congress now, not after the election or by some future Congress or administration. The country's problems are far too pressing. The American people expect us to work together for the good of our country. This year, the Senate should pass a budget. Three years without a budget is completely unacceptable. Congress should also move on comprehensive tax reform, a true all-of-the-above energy policy, and the elimination of burdensome regulations that are hurting businesses and hindering job creation. And we can't stop there. Congress must act swiftly to put forth a plan to deal with the largest tax increase in U.S. history that is only, only eight months away. These are issues that can't be dealt with overnight. We need to start now. And anyone who says there is no time to get these things done either hasn't been watching the Senate floor lately or does not believe this country is headed toward a fiscal cliff. Where are the Democratic-led Senate and the President? Where are they? What are they waiting for? What's the reason for the delay? The President giving another speech loaded with the same old ideas that have failed before is not going to cut it anymore. The President's uh, post-it note checklist is insufficient to handle the challenges we face as a nation, and frankly, it's completely counterproductive. <clears throat> Yesterday, the majority leader said Democrats are willing to make the tough choices. Well, we're waiting. We're waiting. And with all due respect, we have a tough time believing our friends across the aisle when the only issues they care about these days are show votes coordinated with the White House 
for political gain. So today, let's stop the showboats that are designed to fail. Let's stop the blame games. Let's come together and do what the American people expect us to do. As I said yesterday, our offer still stands. We're ready when you are. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. There will now be 60 minutes of debate on the motion to proceed to H.R. 2072, equally divided between the majority leader and the minority leader or their designees, with the majority controlling the first 30 minutes. Mr. President. Senator from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to speak on that motion to proceed to the passage of the Export-Import Bank legislation that has come over from the House and passed the House uh, with a vote of 330 to 93, so a pretty uh, resounding vote in favor of moving forward on the XM Bank, the Export-Import Bank that is a major tool to financing manufacturing in the United States when they have products to be sold around the globe. Uh, we hear the President talk all the time about the fact that we need to increase our exports. Well, this is a very important tool that has existed for decades in helping businesses uh, across our country produce product and get sales into overseas markets. So the fact that this legislation passed the House, again, with an overwhelming positive vote, and I should point out to my colleagues here in the Senate, without amendment. Uh, it was not uh, amended on the floor. That is that my colleagues on the uh, House side, both Republicans and Democrat, worked out such a, a positive proposal that it went to the House floor without amendment. So now we have the chance to bring it up here and pass this legislation, and I would just uh, urge my colleagues to do so uh, very quickly because this legislation and this authorization for the Export-Import Bank is expiring at the end of this month. So yes, here we are again at the 11th hour, instead of giving predictability and certainty to a very important program, uh, we're down to the last minutes about whether it's going to continue to operate in the normal ways that it does. So I'm here to ask my colleagues to, uh, on the Republican side of the aisle, to move forward, do like your House colleagues did, uh, uh, agree to the legislation, and uh, let's get it out of here so that people know in in across America that this program will continue. Mr. President, I toured uh, Washington State, who uh, has many, many companies that benefit from the Export-Import Bank. One of them was a company in Spokane, Washington, uh, SCAFCO, which uh, happens to be one of the largest makers of grain silos uh, in the world, and they export these grain silos. They're used in the United States, but they're used all over the world. And I saw uh, 200 workers there that know firsthand how important it is to get this legislation uh, adopted and move forward because it means sales of those grain silos all around the world. And they have used this uh, financing mechanism to expand overseas sales to 11 new countries and to make sure that they were continuing to uh, compete on an international basis. If you look at over the last five years, this bank has supported over $64 billion of sales and exports in Washington State. And so yes, the, some of those jobs are related to aviation, but 83,000 of uh, related jobs in Washington State are small businesses, companies like Sonico and Moses Lake, uh, which is a machine shop, and they do repair parts for aircraft for uh, 40 different clients spread across, across the globe. Uh, we were at another company in Yakima, a uh, music company, which uh, if anybody's heard of Manhasset Music Sands, it's an unbelievable story of a success of a company that is, uh, has sales of uh, over a million dollars to various uh, countries around the globe and people who definitely like the fact that made in America means quality and that they have been able to access all of these markets. And we saw in a company in the Everett area, Esterline, which has built airplane parts and employs over 600 people, 
have used this agreement. Basically, they build the overhead cockpit part of airplanes and they sell those uh, to a variety of uh, businesses all around the globe. And so without the financing of the Exim Bank, these companies lose out on an international basis to the financing mechanisms that other countries have, whether that's Canada, Europe, other places. So this program is very, very successful. And I might add, adds uh, billions of dollars back to the U.S. government. This is not a program that costs us money. This is a program that basically generates revenue back to the federal government. So I just want to say to my colleagues, there were several things that were added in the House bill, a GAO report on evaluating the banks and capital market conditions, a, um, uh, making sure that they do an annual report on due diligence and the purpose of the loan, uh, additional requirements by Treasury, uh, making sure that, um, that we continue to oversee the Exim Bank. So lots of language uh, in making sure that there is transparency in the Exim uh, Bank financing mechanism. So I think that this is a good resolution. I, I applaud my colleagues in the House, uh, Representative uh, Hoyer and Cantor and Boehner, who all worked on this agreement, and I hope that my colleagues will move uh, quickly on it. There's one thing that we know right now. We need to do everything we can to help our economy and to help jobs. Well, the Exim Bank has been a proven job creator in the United States, helping U.S. companies compete internationally. It has helped us pay down the deficit in the past, and now all we need to do is give it the certainty that it will continue to operate as of May 31st this year. So let's get on with this uh, business of making sure that we're focusing on the economy and make sure the Exim Bank, we proceed to this measure and pass this as soon as possible. I thank the president. I yield the floor. Senator from Colorado is recognized. Mr. President, before I turn to uh, speaking to the subject of student loans, let me associate myself with the remarks of my colleague, our colleague from the state of Washington, uh, Senator Cantwell. I heard the Republican leader talk about uh, a pro-growth agenda. Well, there's nothing more pro-growth than exporting American goods and services uh, overseas to the growing markets all over the world. And the XM Bank uh, has a long record of providing the foundation on which our, our businesses, small, medium, and large, can do just that. So uh, let's bring up uh, what the House has passed and move it through this chamber as fast as possible. Uh, Mr. President, I mentioned I wanted to uh, stand up this morning and speak in, on behalf of students all across America. Uh, in my home state of Colorado, uh, students and recent college graduates are literally struggling with a mountain uh, of loan debt. Uh, now, as a mountain climber myself, uh, I understand that mountains can be overcome, but in an economy like this one where recent college graduates are struggling to find work, we need to do more. We need to do everything we possibly can to make college more affordable. And that's where we, the Congress, comes in. The interest rate, as we all know, on the federally subsidized Stafford loans are set to double on July 1st, barring congressional action. So we, have, we, we just don't have much time to play political games here before the mountain of debt facing our students begins to grow even higher. Student loans play a crucial role in making higher education possible for millions of Americans. And for many Americans, higher education is the gateway to their future careers and to better paying jobs. So that's a good thing for our families and it's a good thing for our economy. Again, referencing the Republican leaders' concerns about a pro-growth agenda. Uh, more specifically, let me talk about what the federally subsidized Stafford loans uh, do. They're designed for American students from low to middle income families so that they too can afford to go to college. And at a time when students are facing escalating tuition costs and an uncertain job market after graduation, it would truly be irresponsible for us not to act as soon as possible. But I have to report to you uh, and uh, uh, our colleagues that we're being blocked from doing just that. Uh, there's a common sense proposal before us that would prevent these student loan interest rates from doubling, but it's being filibustered. Uh, all these students want, all our the young people that we all know, uh, want is an opportunity to better themselves and contribute to our nation's economic growth. And we have a chance to offer them that opportunity, but we've got to end 
the political games here and get to work. We can't let partisanship stand in the way of a college education for young Americans. It, it just doesn't make sense, certainly out in my state of Colorado. Uh, Coloradans understand this, and they're telling me, as I think they are in the presiding officer's state and states all across the country, just, just get it done. Uh, there's there's uh, no time left to just get it done. Uh, I asked Colorado students um, through my Facebook page to contact me with their concerns so that I could share them here on the Senate floor, and I wanted to bring their voices directly to the Congress so we would all understand better what's at stake in, Co in Colorado and all over our country so that uh, it might give us some additional motivation. So I'd, I'd like to share a couple of stories uh, here on the floor of the Senate. Uh, Justine Espinall is from Aurora. She's a single mother of two children. She's currently enrolled in nursing school after being displaced from her job in the mortgage industry. She enrolled in nursing school so that she could provide for her family and contribute to the workforce. She said, quote, I am just barely making ends meet and need the help of student loans. Please don't double my interest rate. Then there's Nicholas Collins. He's a senior communications major at the University of Colorado. And he's in the middle of preparing for final exams this week. But he took time to write to me. And he wrote, Senator Udall, I will be graduating two weeks from today. I could not imagine a future where students would be forced to pay up to $1,000 more per year to pay off their loans. I would not be in the position I am today if it wasn't for federal aid. The concerns that are expressed by Justin and Nicholas are just a couple of vivid examples of the concerns facing millions of American students. Mr. President, as you know, we all know there's a broad consensus that we have to prevent these Stafford loans from doubling on July 1st. However, many of our friends on the other side want to raid the Prevention and Public Health Fund to offset the costs of these student loans. Now, this fund is aimed at preventing chronic disease, and it was implemented as a part of the Affordable Care Act. The Prevention and Public Health Fund helps to reduce chronic diseases, including diabetes and heart disease, while also providing much-needed dollars towards immunizations for children. And I understand that the health bill uh, was controversial, but to continue attacking it, especially when uh, students' futures are on the line, is a puzzling to say the least. While we could be closing unfair tax loopholes, as the underlying bill proposes, the Republicans here in the Senate are telling us that we have to choose between a bright future for our students or preventing chronic disease for millions of Americans. That just doesn't make sense. This is about providing opportunity to say that we can no longer care for the sick or help prevent chronic disease if we want to help students is a false and I might say political choice. There are plenty of tax loopholes, big oil subsidies and other savings that don't leave students, the sick, or hardworking Americans out in the cold. Mr. President, uh, we owe it to people like Justin and Nicholas to come together to find a way to ensure that American students continue to have access to affordable loans. I look forward to working with you and our colleagues here in the Senate to make sure that we do right by our nation's students on this. And I'd urge all of us to end this impasse and instead work together. Let's roll up our sleeves literally and figuratively and find the right solution. Let's prove to Coloradans, to the students in Colorado, and to all the students across our country that the Senate can accomplish something important for our nation's education system, our country, and our way of life. President, uh, with that, I yield the floor and I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Acaca.
with the quorum call. Without objection, the Senator from New Mexico is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I, I rise today uh, to just say a, a few words about uh, my good friend and my mentor in the Senate, Senator Richard Lugar. Uh, I heard both uh, leaders here this morning uh, mention Senator Lugar, and I just thought I would uh, rise for a minute to talk about him uh, because I've been lucky to have him as a mentor since I've arrived in the Senate. Uh, uh, Senator uh, Mark Pryor uh, organized for our class when we came in. Uh, mentors, usually a senior Democrat, senior Republican, and, and Senator Luger uh, was, uh, was that uh, mentor for me. And, he, and, and I've spent, as a result of that, uh, a great deal of time with him, uh, both uh, uh, in, uh, at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and a variety of meetings. And he's always given me, the, the, the remarkable thing is he's always given me very, very uh, valuable advice. And above all, uh, his, his advice has been is to urge bipartisanship, uh, not for its own sake, uh, but because it's what makes the Senate work and what allows us to move forward. Um, and I didn't want to get up, as, as one of the leaders pointed out, he's going to be with us for eight more months, but I thought that there was something very important uh, in his statement that he made, which I ask that the full statement be put in the record, uh, Mr. President, uh, and then I just want to read, Without objection. A, yeah, read a few words um, from what he said after he uh, suffered this electoral loss. And I think these are words that we should all uh, listen to here in the Senate because they're so wise uh, and they kind of put us, uh, give us advice and put us on a path that we should be on. Uh, and here, these are Senator Luger's words. Legislators uh, should have an ideological grounding and strong beliefs identifiable to their constituents. I believe I have offered that throughout my career, but ideology cannot be a substitute for a determination to think for yourself or for a willingness to study an issue objectively and for the fortitude to sometimes disagree with your party or even with your constituents. Like Edmund Burke, I believe leaders owe the people they represent their best judgment. Too often, bipartisanship is equated with centrism or deal-cutting. Bipartisanship is not the opposite of principle. One can be very conservative or very liberal and still have a bipartisan mindset. Such a mindset acknowledges that the other party is also patriotic, and may have some good ideas. It acknowledges that national unity is important and that aggressive partisanship deepens cynicism, sharpens political, sharpens political vendettas, and depletes the national reserve of goodwill that is critical to our survival in hard times. Certainly this was understood by President Reagan, who worked with Democrats frequently and showed flexibility that would be ridiculed today from assenting to tax increases in the 1983 Social Security fix uh, to compromising on landmark tax reform legislation in 1986 to advancing arms control agreements in his second term. I don't remember a time when so many topics have become politically unmentionable in one party or the other. Republicans cannot admit to any nuance in policy on climate change. Republican members are now expected to take pledges against any new tax increases. For two consecutive presidential nomination cycles, GOP candidates complete, competed with one another to express the most strident anti-immigration view, even at the risk of alienating a huge voting bloc. Similarly, most Democrats are constrained when they talk about such issues as entitlement cuts, tort reform, and trade agreements. Our political system is losing its ability to even explore alternatives. If fealty to these pledges continues to expand, legislators may pledge their way into irrelevance. Voters will be electing a slate of inflexible positions rather than a leader. I hope that as a nation we aspire to move 
more than that. I hope we will demand judgment from our leaders. And those are the words of Senator Luger. I think they're very wise words. I think we should all read his, uh, his whole speech and try to put the Senate on a better path. Thank you, Mr. President. I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
to uh, speak as if in morning business. South Dakota. Mr. President, I would ask unanimous consent that the uh, quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, in just two weeks, like many proud parents across this country, I will be watching as my youngest daughter walks across the graduation stage. For some students, this important milestone marks the end of their college days and the beginning of a professional career. This achievement should be filled with hope for a great future. But for many, it will be a story saddled with student loan debt and uncertainty about the economy, their job prospects, and their future. As I've listened to many of my Democratic colleagues discuss the extension of the special interest rate for the subsidized Stafford loans, I continue to hear false statements that would lead you to believe that Republicans don't support extending this interest rate for students. Mr. President, that's simply not true. In my state of South Dakota, nearly 30,000 students received subsidized Stafford loans during the 2011 and 2010-2011 school year. While I support alleviating financial pressure on students, I did not support the partisan legislation that was brought forward by Majority Leader Reid that would extend subsidized Stafford loans while raising taxes on some employers, not because of the goal of the legislation is misguided, but because the way the Majority Leader proposed to pay for the legislation is misguided. Majority Leader Reid's legislation, like its Republican counterpart, would extend the special rate of 3.4% for subsidized Stafford loans that existed for the 2011 and 2012 school year to the 2012 and 2013 school year. I agree with the extension of this special rate and would simply ask the majority leader to allow a vote on the Republican alternative, which I might add passed the House of Representatives by a bipartisan vote on April the 27th. I voted against moving to the majority leader's bill because I disagree with the way that my Democratic colleagues have proposed to pay for the temporary one-year extension on two grounds. First, I fundamentally disagree with the idea of a permanent tax increase on certain job creators to pay for a temporary one-year extension. We're talking about ter permanent tax changes to pay for temporary spending. That is bad policy, Mr. President. But I further, furthermore believe that any discussion about raising taxes should be addressed in a comprehensive tax reform discussion, not in a student loan bill. Second, I disagree with diverting the payroll tax revenue away from the Medicare and Social Security trust funds where it would ordinarily be directed. And we saw this done during the health care bill a couple of years ago where uh, Medicare reductions and revenue increases that, supposed, that were supposed to go to extend the lifespan of Medicare were in fact used to pay for new spending. We cannot continue to try and fool the American people that we're somehow extending the lifespan of Medicare when we are spending that money on new programs. We're essentially double counting revenue and spending the same money twice. You cannot do that, Mr. President. You cannot do that anywhere else in the country, in this economy. And yet here in Washington, D.C., that's become the practice. Well, what this would do is take uh, tax changes changes in the tax code that would ordinarily go into the payroll tax fund or Medicare trust fund, and now that's going to be used to pay for something else. This is a practice we cannot continue. We cannot sustain. We all know that our trust funds are headed toward bankruptcy, and continuing to, to raid them and use them for other purposes is simply uh, a recipe for disaster. And so I would agree with the 37 business groups who wrote a letter to uh, leaders Reed and McConnell strongly opposing the $9 billion tax increase on small businesses proposed in the majority leader's legislation. Now, these groups represent millions of employers, and they range from the National Federation of Independent Business to the Independent Community Bankers to the National Restaurant Association. Thirty-seven business groups all coming out opposed to the changes, the tax increases that would be included uh, to pay for this, uh, or, change, or keeping the, uh, the interest rate at 3.4 percent. Now, I believe there could be bipartisan support for a proposal that's been put forward by Senators Enzi and Alexander, who are both leaders on education policy here in the Senate. They proposed an alternative that pays for a temporary one-year extension of the 3.4 percent interest rate by taking money from a slush fund created by Obamacare in 2010. The President and Democrats have supported taking money from the slush fund in the past, so it seems odd that now they're suddenly up in arms 
in support of a slush fund that is supposedly aimed at prevention. The President's own fiscal year 2013 budget proposal recommends using the prevention slush fund for other federal priorities. And my Democrat colleagues here in the Senate supported taking $5 billion from the fund um, merely in 11, 11 weeks ago. So there's broad support for the idea of prevention. But the recent record of the use of federal prevention dollars shows that these dollars are not being spent wisely. Funds in the prevention slush fund can be used on almost anything in the name of prevention and wellness. For example, uh, jungle gyms, bike paths, farmers markets, those are the types of things that this so-called prevention slush fund is being used for. Now keep in mind in 2010 that my Democrat colleagues used the $9 billion in savings in federal student aid program changes to pay for part of Obamacare. Instead of using that money to address the looming issue of the scheduled return to these higher interest rates on student loans. It only seems rational, it only seems fitting, Mr. President, to use the money that came from the student loan industry to address the interest rates for subsidized Stafford loans. It strikes me at least as very logical that since these funds were diverted from the student aid fund in the first place to pay for Obamacare, that we ought to recapture some of those funds to help keep student, rate, student loan interest rates at the lower 3.4 percent level. Now, it's particularly interesting that the president suddenly taken such a deep interest in this issue when in 2007 he didn't even show up in the Senate to vote for the original legislation that created the temporary phase-down interest rate for subsidized Stafford loans. So despite the president's rhetoric, the greatest threat to young people looking for a job isn't the loan rates, but the Obama economy. This year's crop of college students looking for jobs are confronting an economy in which unemployment has remained above 8% for 39 straight months. A recent Associated Press report found that one out of every two recent graduates is jobless or underemployed within a year of finishing school. Graduates that are lucky enough to find a job will earn 9% less than if they had graduated just a few years ago. A Gallup poll released this week gives even more bad news for young adults. According to Gallup, underemployment among 18 to 29-year-olds has hovered around 30 percent for most of the past year. Those graduates lucky enough to find employment are more likely to find jobs as waitresses, waiters, and bartenders than as engineers, physicists, chemists, and mathematicians. On Tuesday, the president was out touting his to-do list for Congress. Now, that's particularly interesting since the president has had three and a half years to put policies in place that would strengthen the economy. So here's what our graduates are getting. Here's what that Obama economy has brought about. Long-term unemployment's up 89%. The number of Americans who are on food stamps is up 45%. Gas prices have doubled. College tuition is up 25%. Worker health insurance costs are up 23%. And the federal debt that we're passing on to future generations is up 47%. Now, the only thing that's gone down on his watch are home values. They're down 14 percent. Mr. President, our country and our college graduates have had enough of the Obama economy. Instead of the to-do list that Mr. the President's put forward, Mr. President, we have a to-stop list for you. Stop job-killing regulations that are hurting our small businesses' ability to create jobs. Stop trying to raise taxes on job creators and small businesses who are the people that are going to hire our college graduates. Stop blocking the Keystone XL pipeline, which would help wean our country from the dependence that we have on foreign sources of energy. And stop the divisive use of class warfare that does nothing but divide Americans. It's time for the President and Congress to come to the realization that we have got to shift our focus away from election year standoffs and come together to focus on changing the course of our lagging economy so that we can once again put our young people back to work. That, Mr. President, is the real objective which should be our focus here. Uh, these other issues which are a lot of campaign gimmicks, a lot of uh, opportunities to politicize this issue or that issue uh, are really counterproductive in the long run. And the floor of the United States Senate is being used, it seems like, more and more these days to make campaign points, political points, rather than to address the fundamental issues that are affecting Americans and our economy. And I would hope that we can come together to work 
in a constructive way on policies that will get Americans back to work. And that means doing something about these regulations which are crushing the ability of our small businesses to create jobs. And you hear about it every single day. When I travel my state of South Dakota or elsewhere around the country, you hear from businesses, the people who are out there trying to create jobs, about regulations, about taxes, about the cost of things, their inputs going up. Those are the issues that we ought to be addressing. We ought to be figuring out how we can reform our tax code, how we can do reducing federal spending and reforming our entitlement program so that we can save Social Security and Medicare. We ought to be looking at what we can do to put in place a real all-of-the-above energy strategy that would help keep energy costs affordable for people out there who are creating jobs. You know, those are the types of things, uh, Mr. President, that in my view uh, we ought to be focusing on. And frankly, uh, we've seen a lot of action and activity in the other body in the House of Representatives, many bills that they have sent to the United States Senate that are small business bills that would address these very issues, the high cost of regulations. Uh, the issue of taxation, the issue of energy independence, uh, all these things that we believe would uh, lead us toward a stronger economy that would get Americans back to work and offer more opportunity to young people, to our college graduates as they emerge uh, from, their, from their programs of study uh, this year and in years to come. Uh, and yet, we, we continue to have uh, the rhetoric here on the floor of the United States Senate suggesting that somehow Republicans are not in favor of keeping interest rates low for, for student loans. I mean, think about that. It's just illogical to even suggest that. But we do have a fundamental difference of opinion about how we ought to pay for that. Uh, the other side suggests that we pay for that by raising taxes on people who create jobs. We believe that you ought to go back and take the, the funds out of the prevention slush fund, which was created incidentally in the first place, out of dollars that were allegedly saved when the federal government took over the student loan program, which happened as a part of Obamacare. Not a lot of people realize that because it got buried in the whole debate over health care, but the student loan program, which used to be administered out of private lenders where they originated and serviced the loans, has now been taken over by the government. And in doing so, savings were counted that were then used to pay for the cost of the health care bill. And so all we're simply doing is saying the slush fund that was created by the funds that supposedly were saved by moving the student loan program into the government, we ought to be using student loan programs, fund, fund programs, to actually keep the, the funds that ought to be used to, to fund keeping the uh, interest rate low down at the 3.4% uh, for college students today. It's, it seems, as I said, very fitting to me, uh, very logical, very intuitive, that that would be the way that we would fund this. But to suggest for a minute that somehow Republicans here in the United States Senate are not in favor of keeping interest rates at as low a rate as possible as, as, uh, for our, our college students is, is completely missing the point in smacks of election year politics. And I hope that we can, uh, we can get away from that and really focus on not only a solution in the near, in the near term to this issue, but also the bigger issue. And the bigger issue is the fact, as I just mentioned, that literally one half of all college students today that are coming out are either not finding jobs or are underemployed. And those that are finding jobs are making significantly less than those who graduated just a few years ago. That is an, an economic problem. That is a problem that needs to be addressed, not, not by uh, simply having a debate about uh, student loans, but what we're going to do to get this economy growing again and get American businesses creating jobs. We need to make it less expensive and less difficult for American businesses to create jobs, not more expensive and more difficult, which is precisely what's happening today as a result of the policies coming out of this administration in the form of regulations and many of the, 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 the legislative initiatives that are coming out of the Congress or at least being proposed to come out of the United States Senate. I want to work with my colleagues on, on solutions that will put Americans back to work and give our college graduates greater opportunity, greater hopes for a higher standard of living, a higher quality of life, something that many of us have inherited from those who've come before us, but is inc increasingly at risk and in jeopardy today simply because of the amount of spending, the amount of debt, and the policies coming out of Washington that are making it increasingly difficult for us to get out, uh, out from underneath an economy that is struggling with anemic growth and chronic high unemployment. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President, Senator from Arkansas. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I want to thank the Senator for South Dakota for his leadership.